Good morning. To start today, I want to ditch my intro and, and do something different, and that's this. Um, I'm fully aware that many of us come to this place, or you log in on Facebook or YouTube or listen during the week, because you want to receive something. And we say it week after week after week, that what we don't want you to receive is a good learning. I mean, I hope you learn something, and I hope you, have a, you hear a great band. But if there's anything at all that we would pray, and we do pray every Wednesday at noon for this, that you, no matter how you're engaging right now, would have an experience, an encounter with the Most High God. And our series that we're looking at as we end Exodus, as we look at the tabernacle, is all about that. What does it mean to encounter and experience God and each of us, no matter where we are in our spiritual life, just learning about Jesus, not yet believing in him, or perhaps you've been saved since you were a kid. Wherever you are, that we come closer to Jesus, that we have an experience with his presence. So today I want to start with that because I know in a room like this and however you're engaging right now, that you have some things you bring into this moment, to bring into this room, to bring into this experience. So do something with me. Take a little risk, okay? Close your eyes. Put your palms down like you're dropping something. Like you're letting something go. And what is it right now that you need to let go of this morning? You may have walked in with some shame and it has followed you into this service. You may have walked in with a stress for something you have coming up today or this week. Some relational things. You fought on the car on the way here. Whatever it would be, what do you need to put down right now? Go ahead and verbalize it. Whisper it. Let him know. God, I put this at your feet. I leave this here. Take this. Father, I pray the burdens and the things we carry into this place, Lord, as we symbolically place them down at your feet, I pray that, Lord, you would help us to release those truly, that you would take them from us, and Father, we turn our palms up right now because people I know we need and we hope and we desire to receive something and not just something in church, but something from God himself. So eyes closed and your heart open. What is it you would desire and ask God for in this moment? What do you, what do you need? What do you want? What do you hope? Let him know. Hope. Freedom purpose, direction, clarity, blessing, protection. Father God, we, your people, we are in need. And Father, there are those of us with our palms open right now who don't yet know your son Jesus. We need you to reveal yourself. Father, though those of us with palms open who have known you our whole life and our passion is gone, and we need, Father, fresh wind and fresh fire in our heart. And Father, for all the needs whispered and spoken and, and too hard to even whisper, will you hear our prayers today and meet us in Jesus' name, amen. The purpose of the tabernacle that we are going to study is this, God's presence. If you were here last week, you saw something that probably blew you away and you have never been the same. It was a drawing I did here on stage. It's still over there. It's so, I got emails about it all week long making fun of me. I saw one person kneeling at it trying to accept it into his heart. It doesn't work that way. The drawing's good, but it's not that good. But we were talking about how the tabernacle that we're going to be studying in Exodus is actually, it seems so random that God would say, build me a house to come in. But when we look at the pattern of God, we see we had, a, the pattern starts in Eden, a God who wants to come down and be with his people and different places that were more sacred. And then we moved to Mount Sinai and a God who wants to come down and be with his people. And we have outside the mountain, at the foot of the mountain, the mountain, and then only Moses, the mediator, could go to the top. And now God says, build me this place, the tabernacle. And it has the same divisions. And so you might be new to this series. You might be new to this church. You might be wondering, why in the world are you studying something from thousands, a building from thousands of years ago at the, at the beginning of the Bible? Why are you looking at that? And here there's a reason, because I believe that this is very important. This is part of what God has done back then that has everything to do with what he did in Jesus and what he's going to do in our life moving forward. Not only that, there was something else. I got lots of memes sent to me, uh, social media messages, texts, uh, 
conversations uh, because as we read this Exodus account, we're going to see that there's some things that are strange. Animal sacrifice, all these things that seem culturally just so wild. And one thing I, I claimed last week was that the 90s were the greatest, was the greatest music of, in, 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 in all time, especially 90s rap. And, and some of you, like, I, you left churches. Some of you aren't here with me today because you heard that. You said, I need a new preacher. That's okay. Some of you, you've never heard 90s music. You're so young. Others of you, I was so proud of you this past week. You pulled out your glasses, and then you got your phone, and, and, and you typed out a message to me and told me that the 70s were the best music. I was so proud of you. I've never heard of 70s song, but I'm sure they're great. But, but here's the deal. My point was this, that the music that we love in the past, it's so culturally irrelevant in the present, isn't it? Have you heard what the kids listen to these days? I mean, but, here, but now we, then we go thousands of years in the past, and we look at this culture, and we go, why are they doing those things? And I just want to say, let's let the culture, what, what happened back then, that's what they were doing, but let's look at the symbolism, and what does it have to do with us now, and what does it say for us moving forward, okay? Because you're going to see some things this week and in the coming weeks that make you go, what? And again, we're not going to sacrifice any animals. We're just going to talk about it. We're going to leave the cultural stuff there and see what Jesus has for us now, okay? We are talking about the tabernacle. This building, and it is intricately, uh, instru- the instructions are intricate about what God said. Every inch, every cubit, all these things about how to build it, what to layer it with, what kind of uh, garments, what kind of wool, what, everything is so specific. And to give us a picture of what the tabernacle is going to look like, we have a video today. And this video is going to take us through the different sections because it's built into different sections like we discussed last week. So let's watch this video and engage with this building that we're going to investigate over the next few weeks. Go ahead, team. tabernacle, Hamishkan. The Hebrew word means dwelling place. It was where God dwelled with his people, and its elements show us how to relate with God. After delivering the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, God gave them detailed instructions on how to build this dwelling. Once constructed, the Lord descended on the tabernacle in a pillar of cloud. Curtains separated the whole tabernacle from the rest of the Israelite encampment. In this courtyard was the tabernacle's largest piece of furniture, the altar. A wooden box covered with bronze. The altar was shaped as a square, measuring approximately seven and a half feet long and seven and a half feet wide. From top to bottom, it stood about four and a half feet. Hollow space inside the box allowed priests to insert coals. Above was a bronze grating where priests would lay animals for sacrifice. A horn of one piece with the altar stood at each corner. Four bronze rings under the ledge allowed one to insert carrying poles so the Israelites could transport the altar. Between the altar and the tent of meeting was a bronze laver. Priests had to cleanse their hands and feet here before offering sacrifices or entering the tent. Within the inner tent stood one of the most recognized elements of the whole tabernacle, the menorah, a lampstand with three branches that rose on each side to create a total of seven lamps. This solid gold lampstand weighed about 75 pounds. Each lamp was a small cup that the priest would fill with oil to fuel the light. Each branch in the middle of the shaft had almond blossoms. The menorah served a most practical purpose. It was the only source of light in the tent, an eternal light that was never to go out. Also in the tent stood a wooden table covered with gold. On it was to always remain the bread of the presence. The bread of the presence symbolizes God's desire to be with his people. Incense was to burn continuously on the altar. God instructed the priests to replenish the incense every evening and morning. A curtain separated the holy place from the holy of holies. The menorah, the altar of incense, and the bread of the presence were all in the holy place, but outside this veil. 
Like the curtains covering the tent of meeting, this veil was blue, purple, and scarlet, with cherubim, a kind of angel. Beyond the veil, at the far end of the tabernacle, was the ark. The ark was a wooden box covered with gold. It was nearly four feet long. Its width and height were about two feet, three inches. Like the altar, the ark had rings and poles so the Israelites could carry it as they traveled. Within the ark were the two stone tablets on which God had written the Ten Commandments. Later, it contained a sample of manna and the rod that bloomed to reinforce Aaron's leadership. The mercy seat was the ark's lid and features prominently on Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. At each end stood a cherub facing the other with its wings outspread. This cover was made of solid gold. The priest would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice on this mercy seat, symbolizing that the nation's sins were covered for another year. While only the high priest would see it, the mercy seat was the key symbol of atonement that God would forgive his people. Though daily sacrifices on the altar were necessary for payment of sin, it was only through the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement that the stain of sin was washed away. And so there you see the different sections, the different furnishings. And if we can get one of those pictures of Gabriel, the one with the, uh, you can see the temple and the altar, you will see that there are different, yeah, you'll see there the, on the right side, that's where the tabernacle building was, and there on the left you see the, that altar with the fire consuming it there. And so we're going to talk about this altar today. In, in Exodus, there's some very specific instructions down to how, uh, what it's covered with, um, how tall it is, how wide it is. It goes into all the details. You're welcome to read all these in Exodus 27, more on that. But there inside the curtains of the court, as you would pull aside the curtain, you would encounter this altar, often known as the brazen altar. It's the first thing you would see. And it's also where most of the activity of the tabernacle would happen. The places beyond it, right there, you can see the places beyond it uh, would be more and more sacred, allowing fewer and fewer people to go. But the altar, the one of God's people, one of God's people could approach that altar with a sacrifice, and there you would be met by one of the priests, and the priest would help you as you would, and assist you as you would take your sacrifice forward and offer it for one of the many different offerings they had back then. And I want you to briefly imagine yourself in a place like this. I want you to briefly imagine the, uh, the arid and the warm air, the Middle Eastern sun out there in the wilderness, and as you pull aside the curtain and walk into those courtyard grounds, you're immediately struck. You would be, you would, your senses would immediately take in some things. First and foremost, you would see priests dressed in a magnificent livery going this way and that, all busy doing something. You would see the tabernacle itself in front of you beyond the altar where God's presence dwelled. Then you would see the animals, all kinds of animals there in that courtyard, sheep and goats, cows, and even birds. And you would then, of course, where there's animals, you would smell the animals. You would smell the living animals and all that comes with that. And then also you would smell the, uh, the smells of the altar itself where the uh, sacrificial animals would be placed. You would hear them, the mooing and the lowing and all the, the, the clamor of the normal sounds. It would all be right there in front of you. And the altar is one of the busiest places. It's one of the loudest places of the whole tabernacle grounds. And you would have come with your offering and you would approach the altar with your offering to begin your sacrifice with the priest. Now, there are different types of sacrifices that happen here at the altar and different animals used for different one of them. But let's say on this day that you were bringing a young ram. You led a young ram to the tabernacle as an offering for your sin because let's, in, in your life, you've become deeply convicted of some ways that you've been living. You've become conscious of some ways that you have been outside of God's design for you and you have been convicted to go and seek forgiveness and cleansing for your sin to be made right with God. And so you would take this young ram and you would bring it there through the courtyard, wait in line behind those in front of you who were offering their sacrifice, and when it's your turn, you would step up to the altar. You would approach the altar, and there you would offer your animal in the way that Leviticus speaks of. Leviticus gives very detailed information on many different kinds of offerings and all the reasons that you would need one. 
Listen to some of the specific instructions here in Leviticus 1, verses 3 and 4. It says, If the animal you present as a burning offering is from the herd, it must be a male with no defect. Bring it to the entrance of the tabernacle, so you may be accepted by the Lord. Lay your hand on the animal's head, and the Lord will accept its death in your place to purify you making you right with him. And I want us to, to, again, it can seem so culturally strange, but if you begin to look at the symbolism and the words used here, you begin to see there should be some uh, bells going off from things that happen later in this book. There, you're, you're laying your hands upon this animal, this blameless animal, and it, you will, it, will take, it will be accepted in your place to purify you, making you right with God. This animal is going to die on your behalf for what you've done to make you right with God. Now, take note of these certain kinds of sentences as you read the Old Testament, but especially as you read about the tabernacle and the temple in these places, because what they are is they're breadcrumbs. These are, language like that is little breadcrumbs leading for the, forward in the future beyond the tabernacle to something, to someone. From there, you would divide the animal, certain parts of it go on the altar, some of it goes to the priests, as you can read, and the, the ram would be accepted in your place, and you would be made right with God, and you would finish your offering with a prayer of blessing from the priest, perhaps. You would say your prayer, and then you would leave and go back to your family tents with, with uh, forgiveness and cleansing and renewed faith and renewed devotion. And it seems curious to us, like going to a certain place where there's a, a, a I mean, they got a place like this, but they're, they're, they're sacrificing animals and there's priests to help you. And, and in one, some, many of these sacrifices, you're the ones doing the killing. You're the one drawing the blood. Such a curious practice to us in some ways, but so spiritually powerful in others. What was, uh, there were different kinds of sacrifice. I mean, what, what if you sinned against your spouse? What if you'd hurt somebody close to you? What if, what if you needed healing? What if you were going through something and you needed a healing? What, what if you did something unintentional, completely unintentional, but you broke one of the commandments or laws of God and hurt your family or just broke that commandment? What would you do? Well, Exodus and Leviticus, we find there's many different sacrifices that would be brought to the altar for all these different reasons, each one with a unique purpose. The first one is the daily burnt offering. Every morning and every evening, Exodus 29 tells us, they would have a burnt offering every morning and every evening. And this was performed by the priests, not, not you or me, but be the priests of the people. And so we would awaken to the smell and the sense and the reminder of sacrifice. We would awaken and start our day with the aroma and the remembrance that there is a sacrifice that declares us clean. Each morning, each morning reminded of God's forgiveness. His mercies would be new every morning, so to speak. At the end of the day, after we've gone through our work and gone through our day, there would be an evening sacrifice, and we would head to our family dinner smelling the aroma of the evening sacrifice, reminding us that God's favor is upon us. That was the daily burnt offering. There was also burnt, burnt offerings that we would take part in. There was the sin offering or guilt offering. And Leviticus 4 and 6 outline all the details of these, the, uh, the unintentional sin. Let's read part of this. He says, give the following instructions to my people, says the Lord. This is how you're to deal with those who sin unintentionally by doing anything that violates one of the Lord's commands. And so if you have violated unintentionally, they have these for individuals and for the nation in ways they were out of bounds. The third, this was one that they uh, did often, was the gratitude offering. And Leviticus 2 speaks about this one. This was an offering of thankfulness. No animal would die in this one. You would simply bring your offering to the temple out of gratitude. And you would arrive there, and let's say you, you were gifted. Let's say you had a good week, and you had earned some profit. You, to thank God for what he had done out of gratitude, not out of duty, you would go and get some fine grain, unless that was your industry, and you would bring it to the tabernacle. You would wait there in line and go to the altar, and you would hand that choice first fruits uh, of, of your life to the priest, and he would burn a portion of it, and the rest would go to the house of God. And right there, you would offer your thanksgiving and gratitude to God as your offering was brought to the house and burned there on the altar. There was another one. There is a... Um, uh, there's a, the, the prayer of healing, the offering of healing and cleansing for those who would come and bring their animal and wait in line because you have a need in your physical body or maybe in your family. Each of these came with a certain pathway and process, but it all, it all came to the altar. That was where it happened. 
And bottom line, when, you, when we enter the tabernacle, that's the only place we would go to. It's the first thing we would see. It's the first thing we would smell even outside. We would smell the burning. And it was the first step. Most all the time, we would bring our offering to the altar, have our sacrifice, and then go back to our place. Only the priests would proceed from there. Only the, the priests would proceed to the bronze laver beyond it. Then even fewer priests would go to the inside of the holy place. And then only one priest, only once a year, would go to the holy of holies inside. And so they would all start, though, each of those would start at the altar. And this was the sacrificial system of the tabernacle. This is what it was like. All these steps and, and all these animals, the shedding of blood, the offerings given to God for forgiveness or, or for gratitude and thanksgiving or for healing or for sin or for dedication. This is the place we would interact with God. And from here we would return and go back and live our lives as best we could until we would need another sacrifice in the future. Much like with Mount Sinai when Moses would go to the top, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. But we would stay outside. Now, throughout this entire journey, throughout this entire time of looking at the tabernacle and every different furnishing, because again, I don't like just talking about furniture. This isn't like I looked at Exodus and said, oh man, this is great. Wait till we get to the Ottoman. No, no. Like this, there's meaning here. There's symbolism. And actually, there's such deep meaning that we learn about our lives now because of it. And here's the aha that you can already, some of you are already on to. And some of you, you're going to see every week the, oh, I see what's going on there. And that's this. The reason we are doing all this, because there is a symbol, a representation, every single piece of furnishing in the tabernacle and the tabernacle as a whole is an indication of something else in the future. There's a reason that God is so specific with every measurement and, and, and even the metal that's over it. I didn't have time to go in just the metals and what they mean and the colors and the cloths. Everything has a representation in the future. Everything has a fulfillment that's going to happen beyond Exodus. Exodus tabernacle is like a prophetic billboard. Billboard pointing to someone, to someone to come who would fulfill every furnishing. The brazen altar that we look at today is fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus is our altar because before anybody could get into the Holy of Holies, before anyone can go into the holy place, before anybody can even wash in the labor, before any of that, you have to go to the altar. The altar is what gave people access to the life God had beyond them. The altar is what gave the priests access to the tabernacle to go move closer into God's presence. It was the entry. It was the starting point for the whole thing. No altar. If there's no altar, there's no need for a labor. There's no need for any of it. In fact, if a priest were to skip the altar and what needed to happen there and go on inside the tabernacle, he would die. Not because of other priests, but because of the holy presence of God. There was something about the altar, which is where you start and go to, that you must access the rest of it through the altar. And so you and I, we would, we would bring our lamb. What kind of lamb? An innocent, blameless lamb without defect. And thousands of years after this, what is Jesus called? He's called this in the Bible. He's called the Lamb of God. And he was sacrificed on the Passover as a lamb. Next, we would approach the altar and we would place our hands upon the lamb and symbolically lay and place our burdens and sins upon it, identifying our sins upon there. Now, what lamb do we place our sins on in the New Testament? Who has taken the weight of our sin upon them and identified it with it so that by their blood we could be forgiven? Is Jesus, our lamb, fulfilling this. And then there at the altar we would see as the blood was shed and the altar or the offering would be consumed to go up to heaven. Jesus himself would be washed as he went and ascended into heaven. And we would remain there in the Old Testament. We remain there at the altar watching the, the offering being consumed as we prayed. It would be a solemn moment. It would be significant. This is no small thing. We would not come to the altar in the Old Testament the way sometimes we come to church um, because it, you would walk in knowing this is a vital, sacred moment. 
And I am, I am, my sin is, is moving onto the altar to be consumed. And Jesus has done that for us so that we don't have to go in that way anymore. Here's the spoiler. Again, the pattern God started in Genesis continued in the tabernacle and continues on today. And God establishes a pattern actually here in the tabernacle especially of blood sacrifice and atonement, which in ancient days was common. Today, who, is, who was the final sacrifice for us? Jesus. So remember, the whole tabernacle, everything we're going to look at, especially this altar, is a billboard sign declaring, pointing forward to a coming Messiah. And the altar was the requirement for each person to approach first. There was no other way around. If you don't come to the altar of sacrifice, you're not going farther into God's presence. If you don't go to the altar of sacrifice, there was no forgiveness of sin for you right there. You must start there with a desire for freedom and forgiveness. We must start there at the altar to be made right with access to God. And so what's amazing to me is we read this in Exodus 29. It's just so ancient this practice, and then Leviticus, all the details, and for generation upon generation upon generation, priests and their sons and their grandsons and families and their sons and daughters, I mean, it's mind-boggling to me. Every day, every morning, every evening, offerings given, every day, families, people just like you and me, going to the tabernacle, making the journey if we're not in the area, anything, to go there and offer our sacrifice. If convicted of sin, to go and offer our sacrifice. If needing healing or if wanting to offer a sacrifice of dedication and devotion, going to the tabernacle for generation after generation. And then Jesus comes, the Lamb of God, blameless and sinless. And I want you to listen to what Hebrews 10 has to say about this. Hebrews 10 writes about the old system and Hebrews 10 writes about what Jesus did. And so right here it says, It says this, the old system, that's the tabernacle, under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The tabernacle is the trailer that the movie's going to deliver on. The tabernacle, the altar that we're looking at today is a preview for something, for someone who's going to come and be the culmination of these things. And then it goes on. The sacrifices under that old system were repeated again and again, year after year. But those sacrifices that you and I would have made there, that the priest would have made on our behalf, were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. It never provided the perfect cleansing. Every time you wanted to dedicate yourself, every time you wandered and wanted to come back, every time you were convicted of sin, every time you wanted to say thanks, every time any of those things, you would have to go to the temple and offer something at the altar. But it never lasted. Never. Verse 2. If these sacrifices could have provided perfect cleansing, if it would have worked perfectly, the sacrifices would have stopped. We wouldn't have needed any more. For the worshipers would have been purified once for all time. And the feelings of guilt would have disappeared if it would have been perfect. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away the sins. This is why when Christ came into the world, dot, dot, dot. Christ came into the world because there had to be repeated sacrifice for sin. If only there was a perfect way so those things could cease, almost it says. So the altar was a constant, consistent, daily need for you and me and religious people when they come near to God for cleansing and dedication and forgiveness. That was why Jesus came, to once and for all fulfill every necessary need for that so that we can move forward. And then listen, listen to this. Listen to Hebrews 9, verse 13. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of the heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. That's what we're talking about. Under the, under the old system, this blood, that's Exodus we're going to look at this week in the future. But listen, just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our conscience, consciences from the sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of all those breadcrumbs 
of all those prophecies, of all those symbols, of all those signs, it culminated perfectly in one person, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He is the tabernacle. He is today. He is the altar we're looking at. Jesus is the place that you and I must come to first before we go any further. He is the altar. He's the place of sacrifice we must approach first before we go any closer and any farther. He's the altar that opens up the entire path to the presence of God, just like the tabernacle. But not just for the priests, not just for the professionals, but for anyone in any place, no matter what you have done, no matter who you are, if you come to the altar, the sacrifice, that is Jesus. He opens the way to the presence of God. Jesus is where all men and all women must come first. Listen to the words of John 14, 6. Jesus says this. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. This makes the most sense when you look at the tabernacle and the presence and the sacred and the holy of holies place of God. And he says, no one gets to the Father except for through me, for I am the way. Jesus is the altar that opened the way to the Father. Jesus is the way. The altar of Jesus isn't made of acacia wood like the one in Exodus. The prophecy of the altar was fulfilled on a rough beam, most likely of all olive or pine. The, uh, the altar here in Exodus was overlaid with bronze, with deep meaning. But the altar of our Savior wasn't overlaid with bronze, it was overlaid with his blood. The altar that is Jesus was fulfilled upon the cross so that any and all could come to him and be saved. Any could come to him and be cleansed. And he is our altar, the first place we must go to have access to the Father. In Exodus, there were different reasons for approaching the altar because God knew they had different needs. Back then we talked about them, the different sacrifices, the different needs for offering. And perhaps today, you come here today, and the chances are we're not all here for the same thing. In your individual life, you have certain reasons why you need something today. You're hoping for something today. Well, just like the people back then would approach the altar with their need, their desire, we do as well. Maybe you come to Jesus today because you have been walking in sin and in shame. You have wandered. And you have to know there is a sin offering in Jesus that cleanses the Bible says it cleanses us from all unrighteousness. It says there's no condemnation. There's no shame for those in Jesus because at the altar, at the cross that is Jesus, as he fulfilled that, he paid for it all. There's no need for shame. And just for those of you who have received Jesus at some point in your life, I want to speak to something really quickly. Back then in those days in Exodus, they had to continually do offerings to continue to cleanse themselves. Jesus did it once and for all. And so I get this question a lot when someone comes to Jesus for the first time and they go, oh, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. I have been a professional sinner. And I, we talk about what Jesus did and how his work covers it. And they go, okay, okay, good. But now what do I do to make up for it? Or when someone comes in wandering from God, and even though they know Jesus pays for all my sin, they don't know. And you might be like me, that you know, yes, I know Jesus can cover all my sins, but my heart does not feel that. We, we, we have this desire for more sacrifice, and so often I have people asking me what to do next, and what they're really asking is, what's the penance? Like, I know Jesus paid the price for my salvation, but what do I have to pay beyond that? Because I'm so sorry. And I want to tell you that on the offering that is the cross, everything was paid. In the New Testament, because of what Jesus has done, there is no penance. There's, there's none in here. He did it all. He paid for all of it. You get to walk for, you guys should read this book. It's amazing. You get to walk in freedom. You get to walk free of shame. You were called to walk free of penance. There's no need. Well, oh, I got to do something. No, no, he's done it all. He paid for everything at the altar that is the cross. He fulfilled it. So, so don't go back looking to make more sacrifices. Oh, I got to keep doing more. No, no, it's done. It's done. 
Praise God, it's done. And today, if you're here and you have not made the decision to follow Jesus as your Savior, I'm going to be up here in the front during this song, and I would love for you to come talk to me. I want to pray with you so that we, we, you can pray this and have access to the Father. Today, maybe you are here, we talked about the gratitude offering. You come from a life that God has richly blessed in, in many, any different way. And out of the gratitude and thankfulness of your heart, you want to bring the first fruits of your life to the altar to give with a glad heart. The other one is, perhaps it's you come to the altar for healing. You have a tangible need in your physical life. And in the Exodus, they would come to the altar for this. Perhaps you need to come to Jesus for this. Jesus, I need you today. Someone in my family, me, we come to the altar because we need some healing. There's also a, 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 there's also a sacrificial offering in the Old Testament called a devotion or dedication offering. And this is what I want to end on. It's for those who would come to the tabernacle back in the day, and perhaps you had wandered. Perhaps you had gone about your life without thinking much about God, but you have been struck by who he is and what he's done, and you want to go devote yourself fully in a new way to God. And you would bring your sacrifice, and you would wait in line, and you would get up there, and you would give your sacrifice as a devotion. God, I am devoting and dedicating myself in a new way. I want to be closer with you. I want to hear your voice. I want, to, I, want to, I want to walk the way you want me to walk, talk the way you want me to talk, and be who you want me to be. It's a devotion offering. Perhaps today, you are in this place, and, and, and you want that. You want more of God's presence. You want more, uh, more, you want to move closer with him. The offering's been given. Jesus has provided access, but perhaps you would come to Jesus today and say, I know I'm forgiven, I know I'm cleansed, but I want to be closer, and I want to devote myself and dedicate myself in a new way. I'm going to have some of my, my good friends and elders and, and leaders back here in the back. If you are here today and you want prayers for cleansing and healing, you got people to pray with you. If you're here today and you want to have a dedication offering, you can go pray with somebody. Or you can pray right there in your own chair. Because the truth is you don't need priests and people. You have access on your own. So as we go into this song and as we, as we take communion, and as you hold the symbol of Jesus' death and resurrection, shed blood, broken body, the symbol of what would go on the altar, you get that, right? It's the very symbol of what would have gone on the altar. Take a second before you take it. Just stop, pause, and go, Will you forgive me of my sin? And take a moment and ask him or, or, or recount to him the sins. I'm so sorry, God, for the way I've wandered for this and that and the other. Thank you for Jesus. Pray maybe, God, I want to devote myself more fully. Thank you for the offering of Jesus on the altar of the cross. However it is you need, you're, here's what you do today is, but as you take communion, do it in remembrance of Jesus that he on the altar, on the cross, paid everything. And then Orchard, let's worship this God who made a way for us. Amen? If you want someone to pray with you, we've got people. If not, take communion there and pray on your own.